Okay, this is um, the detection of exoplanets. This is new on the specification for the 2017 examination. So uh, if you're revising by going through past papers, you won't find any of any questions on exoplanets before 2017. So important to make sure that we understand this part. Uh, just a little bit of history as to why it's so hard to detect exoplanets. And then the exam board specified two methods that you're supposed to understand. Uh, one's called the Doppler method and one's called the transit method. Uh, so the first thing obviously is to define what an exoplanet is. So people have known about uh, the planets going around the Sun, Mercury, Venus, uh, eventually of course we worked out that Earth was just a planet too. Mars, uh, Jupiter and Saturn were known to the ancients and then Uranus and Neptune were discovered after the invention of the telescope. Pluto, of course, has uh, been discovered as a planet and then found out not to be as big as people thought it was because it's got a large moon and declassified. So there are eight planets in the solar system going around the sun. But only uh, around 1989 was it that we first discovered that there were definitely planets outside the solar system. There was certainly a lot of uh, speculation that these existed due to the speed of rotation of stars. Stars seem to spin much sl more slowly than uh, you would imagine from the collapse of a rotating cloud of gas. So it turns out that that's because of the planets, but they were only confirmed uh, the first one in 1989. So why is it so hard, uh, so hard to, so hard, hard to detect them as it says on here? Um, well it's very hard because of course planets don't make any light. So you, um, we only knew about the planets inside the solar system originally, because of their light reflecting from the Sun. But planets aren't particularly good at reflecting light and of course the amount of light they reflect from the Sun or the star that they're going around is going to be pretty small due to the fact that that light has spread out and then they're only reflecting a certain part of that towards us. So very very difficult to detect any star, uh, sorry any planet outside the solar system in the same way that the ancient peoples managed to detect star uh, planets inside the solar system. Um, so there are lots of possible methods, um, but we're going to just focus on two. Let's just have a look at the history of this. So here we go back to 1989, the first exoplanet discovered. And you'll see all these other one, all these early ones are coloured in blue. This is radial velocity, what we're calling the Doppler shift method. Um, and then as time goes by, uh, more and more stars are dis uh, I'm sorry, more and more planets are discovered using the transit method and the transit method becomes the dominant method by 2014 uh, due to the launch of the Kepler um, space satellite, the telescope, which is looking specifically for the transit method. Okay, and just a few by these other sorts of methods which only work in very specific circumstances. So here's method one, the Doppler shift. Um, here is a star, so the big circle here is a star and the small circle is the planet um, orbiting the star. And the key point to notice here is that, although we always say planets go around stars, in fact, they rotate around their common center of mass. So this cross here is the, oops, this cross here is the common center of mass of the system. And as the planet goes round, the star appears to wobble. Now, of course, if we were looking at the light from this star from where we are, then you wouldn't see any change in the frequency of the light because of the Doppler shift, because it's not moving towards or away from us. So this method only works if you're more perpendicular, uh, sorry, beg your pardon, more parallel to the plane that the planet is going round in. So we'll remember the Doppler equation, the change in wavelength divided by the wavelength is um, the velocity of the object divided by the speed of light, which I see here of course is the speed of light because we're looking at the light from the star. And the methods that we use to do this is the first thing we do is to calculate the velocity of the star because of course that's the thing that's giving off the light um, using the Doppler equation. Then we can calculate the radius of the star's motion because we know how long it takes. Okay, We know from this how fast it's going. We know how long it takes to go around by watching the period of um, that it takes for the wavelength to increase and decrease. That gives us a velocity and a radius, will give us a distance to the planet. Then we can see how much it wobbles 
which will give us the relative distances of the star and the planet okay, from the center of mass. So if we know how much the star moves, we can work out how far away the planet must be okay, relative to the masses. And that gives us the mass of the planet, assuming, of course, that we can work out the mass of the star using the sort of information that we've used previously. So quite a complicated process, quite a lot to go through. Um, here's an example. So we look at the hydrogen uh, Balmer absorption line, it's 486. I've just rounded the numbers off to make it a little bit easier to understand it. So in the laboratory in, uh, on Earth, we decide that this is 486.1000 nanometers. But we look from the star and we find out that it, it goes up to 1004. That's an increase in wavelength as it moves away from us, a Doppler shift, and then it goes down. 0.0996 as it moves towards us and that this takes 12 days and we estimate the mass of the star is 2 times 10 to the 30 kilograms okay we can do this by um, looking at things like that its position on the HR diagram the Hotspur Russell diagram um, so that's kind of equivalent to the mass of the Sun for example so we can use this to work out the velocity of the star so this is the maximum wavelength so assuming that it's going away from us um, and we're in the same plane Okay, that gives us that the velocity of the star is delta over lambda, which is 247 meters per second, moving away in this case, obviously here, moving towards us. And if these two numbers are um, both increasing and decreasing. Okay, that's quite fast, incredibly now. Um, they can do these velocities down to single meters per second. Okay, so a couple of meters per second, that can actually tell. You can tell, obviously, you're another two decimal places down here in terms of the change in the wavelength. So to get the radius of the star's rotation, well we know how fast it's going and we know how long it takes, 12 days. Okay, so we can just say that the um, the distance around the orbit must be the velocity times the time. So 247 meters per second uh, times 12 days times 24 hours times 3,600 seconds means the distance around the orbit must be 2.56 times 78 meters. And then we just need to do um, the radius is 2 pi r, to get a distance to the star of 4.07 times 10 to the 7 meters. Um, so the distance from the star to the planet, well we can do this with Kepler's law. Uh, so according to Kepler, the cube of the radius is proportional to the square of the period, okay, with our constants that he didn't know, but we worked out later. Okay, and if we plug all the numbers into that, that gives us the radius of the orbit as 1.54 times 10 to the 10 meters. Okay, that's about a tenth of the radius of the Earth's orbit, just to mention. So now we know the radius of the star's rotation and the radius of the planet's rotation, and this tells us about how far they are. If you went back to the diagram, the animation on the previous slide, this is how far away they both are from the center of mass. So this is a bit like a kind of cosmic seesaw operation where the mass of the planet times the distance uh, to the planet is the same as the mass of the star times the distance to the star. Okay, so that gives us this ratio, um, and this ratio gives us that the star is 378 times heavier than the planet. Um, so we estimated the mass of the star at the start, so now we can get the mass of the planet. So the mass of the planet is 1 378th of the mass of the star and this is called a hot Jupiter because they were, all the early planets they discovered were these things which they gave this strange name of hot Jupiter to but you might be able to work out why because this is um, quite a heavy planet so it's a big planet because only a big planet is making the star wobble very much but it's also very close to the star so it's the size of Jupiter but sort of um, you know the distance from the Sun of Mercury that sort of thing. So it's got a large mass, but it's close to the star. So it's hot uh, and big. This is only a minimum mass, okay, because we're assuming in all of this that we're all in the same plane, okay. There is a great little uh, data set here at Exoplanet Archive, um, the IPAC collection from Caltech. And you can look up all the stars, so anytime you click it on this, so I can tell you it's uh, the 20th of May today, but on two days ago, right, two new planets were discovered. And this is how it is now. They're discovering new planets pretty much literally every day of the year. 
a new planet or two get discovered. Okay, but there are limitations to this. It's hard, obviously, the smaller the planet is, uh, the harder it is to detect the change in wavelength from the wobble it causes. Um, so it only works with large planets close enough to the sun to cause a significant change in velocity. Okay, also, it only gives us a minimum mass because we don't know if we're actually in the same plane as the star and the planets right, orbit around the star. So our second method is the transit method. So here's a picture of the transit method. The planet goes across the star. As it goes across the star, the amount of light that we see from the star decreases and we get these little dips. Okay, And this planet going across the star is called a transit. Again, obviously it only works if we're in the same plane, but we know we're in the same plane because otherwise there wouldn't be an eclipse. Um, and by measuring the drop in intensity, we can um, get the area of the planet. Okay, if you look at this diagram, there's a suggestion here that the time it takes for, for the dip to go down here tells us the size of the planet. If we've worked out how fast it's going, we can work out how long it takes to get across here. So there's a lot of complexity to these curves, um, but we don't need to worry too much. Okay, so here's the kind of data you get. You'll see this isn't a huge dip here. Okay, these diagrams can be a little bit deceptive because this is only going from a brightness of 1 down to 0.985. Okay, so it's not dropping that much, but you'll see you always get this curve at the start, which is telling you about the planet starting to get in front of the star to where it's completely in front of the star. Okay, so here's an example of this sort of uh, calculation. So uh, we've got a star with a surface temperature of 5000 Kelvin and a power output of 4 times 10 to 26 watts, and every 12 hours its magnitude dips. Oops, its magnitude dips by 0 0.02. Okay, so surface area of the star, uh, this is Stefan's law. So we can look at this and go the power output is Stefan's constant times a to the um, t to the 4. Remember, we've got our temperature in Kelvin. Okay, so we can uh, we'll use this to work out the area of the star. Okay, remember, we can't tell how big stars are really by looking at them, okay, because they're all we're looking at is the airy disk, but this is our way of getting the area of a star. Now, it's important to understand that if we go back to the previous diagram, it's not actually the surface area we want, it's a sort of cross-sectional area. Um, so to do that, we have to go back from that to work out the radius. So here's the surface area of a star, 4 pi r squared. Okay, that gives us um, the radius and then we can put the radius into pi r squared to work out the area of the star in meter squared. Then we look at the magnitude. The magnitude is dipped by 0 0.02, so remember our formula. Okay, it's gone minus 0.02 because it's dipped by 0.02. A change of 1 is 2.51, so 0.982. So it's 98.2% as bright as it would have been, uh, which is a drop of 1.8%. So, well, why is it dropped by 1.8%? Well, it's dropped by 1.8% because 1.8% of the area of the star has been blocked. So, what's the cross-sectional area of the planet? Well, it's 1.8% of the cross-sectional area of the star. So, we work out that. This tells us the um, cross-sectional area of the planet. Okay, from that we can do pi r squared and work out the radius of the planet. And then if we really want to... Okay, once we know how big the planet is, it's quite interesting to work out its density because, of course, if it's got a density of sort of five or six, that's suggesting it's sorry, five or six thousand, I should say, in kilograms per cubic meters. Um, that will tell us that it's a rocky planet, but if it's got a density of, of sort of more like a thousand kilograms per cubic meter, that will tell us it's a gas giant. So, in the numbers that I've uh, invented for this example, Okay, we've only got a density of 575 kilograms per meter cubed, okay, which is quite low. That's actually less than the density of Saturn. Okay, so this is not a rocky planet. Okay, this is your typical kind of hot Jupiter. Okay, quite close to the star and um, big but relatively low density. So those are the two methods that they expect quite complicated calculations. Uh, certainly they'd lead you through those, I think, in the exams. Um, but you won't find any past papers, so have a good think about that for the next few years, certainly until I've asked a few exam questions.